Let's go with Exodus 33. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would open our hearts, open our understanding. Um, help us to receive your word. Open up our ears to hear and discern. And let the word go deep into our hearts. But cause us to be doers, not just hearers only. Help us to take out, even if it's just one nugget, that we would take it and apply it and own it. And it, that it would transform us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, so it starts with, uh, then the Lord said to Moses, okay, what translation are we doing? Are we doing NIV? Okay. So the Lord said to Moses, leave this place and you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. So right there gives you the understanding of what God was feeling because these are his people but now all of a sudden they're Moses's people which says that God is not happy with the people that he brought out of slavery the people that are descendants of Abraham and he made covenant with Abraham. So let's find out why he's not happy with his people. And go up to the land I promise on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give you and your descendants, and I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. And here's why. Because you are a stiff-necked people, and if I go with you, I'm going to kill you. Now, God had to really be a little upset, don't you think? I'm, I'm, I, see, but you know what? The character of God. I'm going to honor my covenant with Abraham. I'm going to let you possess the promise because I promised it to Abraham and I promised it to his descendants and you just happen to be part of his descendants and I'm going to keep my word. But I'm not going to go with you because you guys are stick neck. You're stubborn. In the scripture it says uh, stiff neck is like the sin of of idolatry. So what, what they were doing is they were being stubborn. They were putting their feelings, their opinions above God's covenant. God's word. God's instruction. And he says, because you idolize and you're worshiping your own agenda, your own opinion, your own way, I can't go with you. I can't, I, I, I can't go with you. I made you a promise, and you're about to possess a promise, but I can't go with you. Because you won't do what I say. Because you seem to know better than me. <laughs> Verse 
because you are a stiff-necked people, I might destroy you on the way. And when the people heard that, they were distressed. They began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people, and if you were to and if I, I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. I'm, I'm going to interject something here. See, because I'm not even sure if it's, if, if it's just God that would just willfully destroy him. Or his power and goodness that couldn't coexist with their obstinance. Because he's so perfect. There's, there's none higher than him. That they had proven themselves to be stiff-necked over and over and over and he continued to provide for them, brought them out of slavery, showed him mighty works, showed them mighty works, and still they felt they knew better. So it goes on to talk about the tents and, um, and how uh, Moses began to, to hang out with the Lord and speak to him face to face. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away calling the tent, calling it the tent of meetings. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meetings outside the camp. And, and whenever Moses went out to the tent, the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance of their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, the son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So Joshua would stand outside as, as, the, as Moses went in to speak to God face to face. And this is the intercession of a leader. Let's move down. It says, um, it says, you have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. So he knew, Moses knew, that God was not happy with the people because of their ways. And he doesn't even bring them in until after he has talked about his relationship. He's going to use his favor to intercede 
for millions of people that God wants to destroy. You talk about pastor. You talk about leadership. Are you willing to use your clout for people who are committing idolatry? They're so full of themselves and their opinion and the way that they want it done that you're going to put your favor on the line for them? Just saying. Remember, we're seeing the character of God, the character of leadership, and the character of human nature. So Moses is, is, is pulling out his favor card. And he's saying, I know you have found favor with me. We are, we speak face to face. But if you really have found favor with me, then remember that this nation is yours. These are your people. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to, them, to him, if your present does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish us or me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? There should be a difference. If God is with you, there should be a difference. If God walks with you, there should be a difference. If you walk in the favor of God, there should be a difference. If there is no difference, then you may not belong to him. Because Moses has drawn a line, a distinction between his, God's people and all the other people on the face of the earth. And the difference is, because we're all created in the image and likeness of God, but the difference is God's presence is with his people. God's presence is with his people. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do everything you have asked. <laughs> I will do everything you have asked. Because I am pleased with you. How many of you can pull that card? And the reason why we, we hesitantly pull that card is because we know ourselves. We know those secret thoughts. We know those inner vows. Now, here's, here's the beautiful thing. Moses wasn't perfect, but he was devoted. He made a 
choice. I'm going to do what God says to do. I am in covenant with him, and I am in all the way. And here's, here's the thing. He told me to lead these people. Just because he changes his mind doesn't mean I can change my mind. Because I know the character of God. Because God is good. God is merciful. And if I jump to the other side, then I'm not reflecting him. So, I will do everything you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. So then Moses is going to take his clout a little further. <laughs> he says, okay. Now, show me your glory. I mean, he had some pull. He had rank. A flawed man had rank. He was flawed. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness, <laughs> all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord. And in your presence, and I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will give have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in, the, in a cleft in, that, in the rock. And cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But not, but my face must not be seen. Moses made a request. And it was a pretty big request. Moses had so much favor that God found a way to honor his request. Moses, if I really show you all my goodness, you're going to die and come up here with me but I still have some stuff for you to do, so I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a way because you said, if I have favor with you, God, then I'm going to find a way to show you you got favor with me, girl. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in this hiding place. I'm going to put you in a protected place. And then I'm going to declare my name. And you know, all the laser and everything. And, and, and you just stay there because I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to cover your face. 
And when I'm almost gone, I'm going to remove my hand, and you're going to see my rumple still skin. You're going to see me from up behind. Because I have to find a way to honor you. Because you have honored me. That's the character of God. And that's the clout of true submitted leadership. And the two together starts changing the hearts of the people because they begin to worship. Exodus 34. So Exodus 34 is um, God is the commandments have been broken and God is getting ready to um, write them down again because what we need to understand is when God puts boundaries on us, it is not to imprison us. It is to protect us. And if we don't have a trust in the power and the authority and the love of God, we would see it more as why? Why can't I do this? Why, you know, how many of you have children or more than one child where they compare what the other one gets to do and they don't get to do? And some of us, even as adults, will look at someone from the outside and judge their life as better than ours because we truly don't have an understanding. But if we truly understood the goodness of God, they would have embraced the laws. Because the laws were not to crush them, but to protect them until they had Jesus. The law was there to set them apart so they, they could walk in the favor of the covenant until there was Jesus. It says, um, so the... So the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up to Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on the mountain, on the top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain, not even the flocks. And the herd may graze in front of the mountain. I mean, God's power is all-consuming. So Moses chiseled out two stones, tablets like the first ones, and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed. Okay, am I? 
Okay. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the name of the Lord. The compassionate and gracious God. Now, this is his name. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithful, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children of their ch and their children for, their s for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. M Moses bowed down. Now, you might re read that part and said, well, how can he be the loving God and then punishing the children of the children's children. And that, that's, that's, that's a great question. But I don't know if you remember um, if you were here on one Sunday when Gordon was spoke on Samson. And, 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 and one thing that he says, I mean, it just resonated in my spirit. He asked the question, who imprisoned Samson? You know, because, because he, he cut off his hair. Delilah and the Philistines imprisoned him. And the answer was Samson imprisoned Samson because Samson broke his covenant. So because God is a just God and he has made provision for sin and it's called repentance, but he can't forgive sin that has not been repented from. If you don't come to the throne room and ask for forgiveness and repent of your sin, there can be no forgiveness. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so I'm sorry, forgive me, should be number one in your vocabulary. Because the other where you run away from God is called stiff neck. It's called stubborn. And, you know, it can dress itself up anyway, like guilt, shame, and all that stuff. Um, you can overcome all those things with, Father, forgive me. And so here's the thing. The scripture talks about sin when it is full grown. It leads to death. That's the fruit of sin. It's not God's choice. But sin is going to produce something. And here's the other thing. It not only produces in you, it produces in your children. And then it takes on what we call generational curses. And if those generational curses aren't broken, then you can pass those things down the same way anointing can pass down. See, because you got a powerful anointing, a powerful calling in your life that can pass down to your children and your children's children and your children's children's children if you teach them the way that they should go. But if you don't, 
and you deny any sin in you, all it's going to do is pass down. Now, it may manifest different ways. But here, God, again, his character. Wait, wait, let me go back. I want to, I want to remind you because he proclaimed his name, which means that he released it into the universe. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. So when the enemy lies to you that God is mad at you, he's slow to anger. He's waiting. He's, 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 he's trying to get all of the universe to make you repent just to come talk to him. Just come talk to me. I'm slow to anger. I'm not going to hit you on the head. I've made provision for you. Come on. Come talk to me. Slow to anger. Abounding in love. That means we can't fathom because he is love. We can't fathom how much he loves us. Gracious God. Slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness, and forgiveness. Wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Forgiving wickedness and rebellion, and sin. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. What's your excuse? I mean, who wouldn't want to serve a God like that? Especially if he's ready to show me all his glory. But he does not leave you the guilty unpunished. And the only way you are guilty, the only way, the only way you are guilty is if you don't repent. That's the only way. If you don't appropriate the blood of Jesus, that's the only way you're guilty. That's the only way you're guilty. Only, only, only way. So what have you done with the blood of Jesus lately? Have you allowed it to cover some of your mistakes? It says, then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. This is, this is where we are right now. This is what God is telling us right now. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. This is why he has these things, because he wants to make a distinction. He wants the world to hunger after him. And the way he's going to make the world hunger after him is to show out in his kids. To show out through his, for his, his babies. You know, I have five kids, and everybody that they hang out with don't have privileges, at least not from us. They have privileges from their parents, but my kids have privileges because they wear the name Banks. We have privileges because we wear the name Jesus. And because of that, 
He wants to make a distinction between us. This is the only time where us and them works. Because he's trying to make them us. That's the only reason. He's trying to make them us. And so he's going to pour out his anointing, his power out on his children and do things the world has never seen. And I'm sorry, you got a lot to do next Wednesday. Because <laughs> I only did two chapters. But, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to continue to read Thirty-four, and I want you to read it the way that I say. I want you to see the character of God. I want you to see the nature of men. I want you to, because um, all of you guys are called to be leaders. I want you to see the character of true leadership. The kind that finds amazing favor with God. Amen. I'm going to give it to my husband and let him read. Amen. You know, Dearjet is an, is an excellent teacher and it's a great word. And her, her sh r real strength is prophetic and uh, she operates in that and is it's great to, to listen to both. You get this dynamic mix that happens inside your spirit. I have a question for you. I'm going to give you a paradox. You've got to fix it. Um, the scripture says that, that um, Moses talked to God face to face like a friend. But then God says to Moses, ah, you can't see my face and live. So which one is it? Did he speak to him face to face? Or did he not speak to him face to face? Because if he saw his face, he's done. Which of the scriptures got a lot of paradoxes like that. Yeah, this is how this is how Moses, I'm gonna walk on the side. This is how Moses encountered God. They did speak as friends face to face. If you read that uh, before the, the that the, the, the tent of meeting, God would come and he would, the glory of God would come in the, to the tent of meeting, right? And that was a signal like, hey, Moses, come here, man. Let's talk. And so uh, Moses would say, hey, man, the glory of God is there. And so the people would stand outside and they would, they would just, they would see the tent from the distance. Moses would actually go inside the tent. And when he got inside the tent, he would talk to God like this. Because the glory of God is in the room. And when the glory of God is in your room, it's not like you're trying to get down. You're just down. So he had never really seen God like that, but he was hearing God. And he was speaking to God like this. Oh, God, you know, these are your people. You know how faithful you are, God. He's talking to him like this, and God is talking to him but he never actually sees him. So Moses wants to get to a place where he's been laying on his face all these times. He says, can I see you? And I've heard you, but I've never really seen you. And then God says, man, if you see me, you're toast. I can't allow you to see me. But, uh, I'm going to cover you and show you my glory. Now, why, why would he even ask to see the glory of God? Because, man, he's been through some stuff. I mean, Pharaoh tried to kill him, and people rebels against him, and, and he's been laying on his face when God calls him. So he just says, can I, can I just see you? Can, I just, can you just show me and have an experience that's transformational? And God says, 
put you behind my hand. Now, he doesn't say he's going to cover him with his. He does, the scripture translates it as hand. But it's not like, it's not like this. This is what we call a hand. God, God would call a hand a cloud of darkness God, or, or brilliant light that, that is like the sun. So God comes into the atmosphere with, with Moses, and Moses goes, Whoa, and God passes through. And then he declares his name, like Deirdre just gave us, because the moment he declares it, it is. Faithful, forgiving, kind, gracious, compassionate. And the moment he declares that, it is. It's not just what is for then. It's what is forever. So Moses realized, whoo! So he steps into this new thing, right? And, then, and it affects the, the rest of the planet forever. God is great. He does extraordinary things. And uh, if you don't get anything from tonight, you should get this, that God does extraordinary things. He's just extraordinary God, and he can do anything. And if, if there's a limitation in your life, it's because you've placed it there yourself. Repent. Turn. Watch God, God, God do something that only God can do. Father, we this. We thank you for your living word and your authority and power and the graciousness that you continually demonstrate to us. And even though we are humans and we make a lot of mistakes, you are able, God, and you are willing to forgive us and to heal us, to transform us. Even, even your graciousness, Lord, did not allow the sin of the Father to be passed into the children forever. For you even changed that process because of the graciousness in your heart to forgive compared to the rebellion in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Um, fulfill your desire in us. Fulfill your desire through your people, God, in, during this hour where there's literal lunacy that happens all over the world. But you, God, created the earth, and it's your footstool. And you've created us to rule and reign here in your image and likeness. And some of the things that are going on in our homes and in our communities and in our states is not from you. It's not reflective of you. And we ask that that be broken, that those things would be over. Some of the sickness and the disease and the poverty and the struggle and the fear and the hatred, we ask that that be broken. And we break that in the name of Yeshua. And within our metrons, our measures of rule, we ask that that measure would reflect Yeshua, the way we talk, the way we serve, the way we give, the way we live our resources, our peace would all be a reflection of the glory of God in our presence. Send the angels, Father, to assist us in the cleanup. We cannot do it alone. Send your rank and your authority as you sent it and establish the work over Moses' life, so establish this work. Be miraculous, God. You're the miracle worker. Do what you do, God. And we remind you that we are your servants, your sons, your daughters. And we belong to you. And you belong to us. And when we declare your word, Lord, within our rule, let your authority and power be reflected through that word. And any words that we speak that are not from you, Lord, we ask that you forgive us and you wash us from those. For let this season 
a, a new dynamic, powerful season. And season after season after season be launched now during this hour in a new era of blessing and favor that would become our possession in Yeshua's name.